Christopher Kassan, and this is Ireland's Edge. With economic and environmental pressures squeezing those who grow, process and cook our food, how can we think creatively about building a fairer and more sustainable future for food and farming? Today I'm joined by three fascinating people to discuss all of that and more. Kuon Green is a chef who has worked at some of the world's leading fine dining restaurants and now edits the Almost Digest, a newsletter exploring food, culture and community. Ella McSweeney presents RTE's Ear to the Ground, and her reporting for The Guardian and other newspapers has exposed major scandals in meat processing and fishing here in Ireland. And Edwina Guckian is an award-winning Shanos dancer and rural activist from County Leitrim, where she has been active in reviving and promoting cultural traditions. In front of a live audience at Ireland's Edge in Dingle, we began by discussing the impact of the COVID pandemic on our farming communities. Make sure to stay tuned at the end of the discussion for a special performance from Edwina and award-winning traditional musician Cormac Begley. It's a great pleasure for me personally to um, introduce this panel uh, to talk about our relationship with food and farming. Uh, in a former life I used to work in academia and my subject of research was the history of food um, and so I'm very interested in how our relationship in Ireland has changed with food over the last few centuries and is going through really something of a revolution right now um, in terms of environmental crisis, in terms of sustainability, in terms of our diet uh, and its relation to our health and so on, and its relation to our culture. And we have three fascinating panellists who we're going to be discussing a lot of that with over the next 45 minutes or so. Um, and I thought that, you know, given what we've been through, there's a, a tendency maybe for all of us to move, move on after the last couple of years because it was such a traumatic experience. But at the same time, it's important for us maybe to reflect on some of the things that have happened um, and how difficult it was for our culture and society, but also how we were able to, able to find ways to be together and to give people comfort in such a difficult time. And uh, one of the most interesting projects uh, to do with that was run by Edwina. Um, Edwina, I wonder if you could tell us a little about, a bit about the, the modern day mummers uh, in Leitrim during the, the early lockdowns during the pandemic. Yeah, the modern day mummers was a project that we we had the idea was that we would try to revive the mumming tradition in Leitrim and it was always at Christmas time and when we just put the project together and we're planning on making the straw hats and getting all the costumes together across that year then Covid struck and um, so the idea behind the mummers if anybody isn't familiar with it it's much like the Rand boys it's across the 12 days of Christmas and you visit houses and bring music and song and dance to them in the idea of bringing luck to them for the new year so we just moved it from Christmas straight into uh, Covid times and spent months we actually spent a year and a half traveling Leitrim and trying to call to as many people as possible and um, mainly elderly or people that just needed a call to and it was wonderful it did as much for me as it did for them and there was people that, um, you know, inviting us in for tea, you know, mad to get you into their house. So <laughs> people wondering with their bank cards, how do we pay, you know. And, uh, there was other people that danced on their doorsteps um, with rollers in, in their hair that had like illegal hairdressers visiting their houses. Um, and there was some like beautiful memories of people uh, asking, could they come with us? You know, can we go with you and see how everyone's doing? And it was a lovely way of passing news as well, because, you know, we called to say Paddy over the road and Paddy would say, well, how's Mary doing up the road? I haven't seen her. And then we go to Mary and we'd say, well, Paddy was asking for you. So we were like these news whisperers as well and started learning lots about the area and townlands as well and things that used to happen. You know, loads of people shared stories. So while we were playing music and singing and dancing for them, the most thing we did was talk. And that's all people wanted to do. Yeah, yeah it was magic. And you are, of course, an award-winning Shannon's dancer. And is that element of dance and music something that, you know, in, a farm, in farming communities when people were isolated from each other, it seemed to play an important cultural role in giving them something, a connection perhaps with their past, a connection with, for, especially for older people, maybe something yeah. that was a connection that was important. I think even aside from COVID, if it was never here, um, music and song and dance is a huge part of community and that's what holds us together and even if we look back to you know hundreds of years ago to what our generations long before us were doing in regards to folk customs everything circled around land and farming and celebrating through music song and dance so 
it's very much like we have a really strong community in Leitrim and the arts and, and the traditional arts in particular mm. holds that community together. And you kind of brought that on then from the modern day mummers into your Sowing the Seed project. I wonder if you could tell us a little about that. Yeah, so Sowing the Seed is about, well basically I wanted to make the straw hats. I live on a farm and every time I asked dad for straw, he handed me these bales of straw and it was about this size, which is no good for making hats, everything's chopped up. So we were trying to source straw that was long for making the mummers costumes and a woman came to work with me to teach me how to make the hats and she had imported it from the uh, UK. And I thought this was crazy that we're importing straw to make the costumes from the UK. So I ended up um, working with the organic co-op in Drumshambo and handing out organic oat seed to anyone that wanted it. We did distribution points from the north to the south of the county and loads of people came from outside of Leitrim like smuggling the oats out mm. <laughs> into other places and posting it left, right and centre. So people um, over a year ago started growing the oats and we have a community um, WhatsApp group now where we report on our growth and failures and you know good harvests. And uh, we do communal growing as well. So a wonderful farmer on the shores of Loch Allen called Tommy Early um, gave us a few acres of his land to also sow. And uh, we came together to sow the seeds and then again in August to harvest. And then using all of that produce, we look at what can we use um, the oats for and make an oaten bread and porridge. And we looked at thatching the crafts like the hen's nests and then of course the mummery tradition. So we're just about to kick off mumming season in Leitrim full belt. Amazing, we'd love to experience that. I mean oats is a fascinating crop as well because of course it's something that has a very very long history in Ireland as part of our diet and it's one of the most important crops we grew. Some fascinating work being done on how Irish beer historically was very much based around oats in a way that's very different to other places in the world. But that's a very inspiring story I guess of how you could use our connection to food and the land in a very difficult time for people. Kuon, you are a chef and at the time of the first COVID lockdown, you had quite a different experience, one that was common to many, many people around the, the country who were working in hospitality. You were working in Bastable Restaurant in Dublin, which just received rave reviews, even in the international press, and then suddenly all restaurants were closed and everybody who worked in restaurants was out of work. What was that like and how did that change your relationship with food? Yeah, um, um, so I just want to say thanks for that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I came back from Denmark. I was working in Denmark for four years. I'd spent three years working at Noma, um, which was at, at the time the world number one restaurant in the world. Um, and I came back to Bastable to essentially um, come back to Ireland. I always felt, you know, regardless of working in all of these restaurants around the world, that I had a kind of a duty to come back to Ireland. It was, there was something just um, forever in, with all of the learnings, it was always like, uh, one day I will return home. Um, and that, that home was Bastable. Um, I was my first head chef job. So the year was, um, it was a really great year. You know, I learned so much about myself, about how to uh, lead a team for the very first time. Um, I really started to um, be able to communicate and meet phenomenal growers and makers um, and wonderful people hidden throughout Ireland uh, for the very first time. And basically it went very well. Like the year was, it was an amazing year from a culinary perspective, very, very difficult. Um, year in terms of we were doing like lots and lots of hours of work and it was very straining um, but at the end in March I think it was the first of March we got um, one of the world's biggest restaurant critics come to our come to Bastable in Jay Rayner and um, it was the first ever review he'd, he'd done in Ireland um, and to be honest we had no idea how it was going to go but the review came out on the day that the restaurant shut due to COVID. <laughs> and normally when Jay Rayner comes to your door and gives you a great review, um, you know, it really, it really kind of sets you up for a phenomenal year. And instead I was sitting at home. So um, it was bittersweet in a way, but at the same time, it allowed me to really you know, it gave me a lot of confidence and I still, in moments of doubt, and I mean, I do doubt myself a lot and we, uh, like, like many of us, I have anxiety and 
Um, one of the things that I do regularly is when I'm in a bad place, I read that review and it helps me um, to really have self-confidence in myself. Um, but consequently, you know, I had a lot, a lot of great support and family and friends around me and it was, uh, they pushed me to basically, you know, use the knowledge that I'd basically gained over so many years, which is, um, became OMOS. So OMOS, um, my company essentially, uh, meaning homage, duty and respect, Asgoilga, so OMOS, Ahurt, Chugradegan, means to give homage to something. Um, and that started as a newsletter. It started as an idea to want to basically share um, everything that was going on in my mind in that moment and not lose it, um, to document what was going on, to document the thoughts, political, so social, um, environmental issues, which were really impacting me at that time um, and still do. So it's been really great. Now we have, um, we're coming close to our 100th art article that gets sent every week um, straight into the inbox. We have over two and a half thousand subscribers some of which are paid, and now we're, we have five paid, um, five paid uh, contributing writers on top of that. So we're really developing this community, and what we talk about largely are the amazing people that exist in Ireland right now doing incredible things, but otherwise are quite hidden. And you're talking about ceramicists, you know, weavers, fisher, fishermen, um, you know, knife makers, all of these type of things. And um, it's kind of snowballed into this um, really wonderful community that have so many different um, insights and understandings about Irish food and culture, which, you know, may not have been explored otherwise or given that opportunity. So, yeah, I'm very proud of what OMS has become and how it's developing. Two very interesting and inspiring stories of the win. a difficult time where our, our relationship with food and farming and the land and crafts and everything were, and our culture were very severely disrupted. Dif different ways for people to connect and different ways to highlight those, dif those ways of celebrating and paying homage, as you say, to our traditions, but also in a more modern way. Um, Ella, your experience during the lockdown maybe exposed a slightly different, more dark side of our food culture. Like a lot of people would know you from your reporting on television and also in newspapers. And during the pandemic, you were instrumental in reporting on some of the terrible working conditions that were being faced by people working, particularly in the meat processing industry here in Ireland where there were very large numbers of COVID cases. What was it like to be reporting on something where it seemed quite shocking to many people in Ireland, the conditions that people were working in in, a, in an industry that is very big player in, in, in our food agribusiness sector, but also plays a big role in what people eat. Like, how did that feel? And what was that experience like reporting on that during the pandemic? Um, oh, first of all, it's, it's a delight for me to be here, and I feel like the misery guts in the panel here. <laughs> I subscribe to OMAS, and it's like a, a, a burst of sunshine into my email inbox. And just before I answer you, um, I just wanted to say I had the very, very lucky um, to go uh, to report on what Edwina was doing during COVID, and it was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most heart sort of warming, moving, profoundly impactful things that I had seen during COVID in the way that you saw. We were there with the mummers and the young kids and just the phenomenal musical talent and the dancing. And we went to the nursing home in Carrick and Shannon and there was um, older people the other side of the glass. And as we all know, the horrors of COVID, you know, people who so many of our relatives and people we knew we weren't able to touch, we weren't able to hug. And it, this was like creating the, the nearest they could ever get to that. And so we had this phenomenal experience I did of just reporting on it. So it was such a moving thing. And I think also brought you back to the, the idea of what farming and is really fundamentally about in terms of the meaning of it is community and people. And I, I know Edwina, so much of Edwina's remarkable work is, is about farming and food, but actually fundamentally it's about people and bringing people together of all generations. So it was just an amazing memory. Now, now to the misery. I won't mention Brexit. <laughs> um, I'll just stick to the other misery. So yeah, I, um, I did, like other journalists, you know, I, I uh, don't claim to be the one that exposed anything, but I certainly looked at what was going on in the, in the meat plants. I think, you know, uh, these, you know, 
the workers in the intensive sector, the, the, the meat workers, the fishing workers, it's easy uh, for reasons that are very obvious because they're out of sight, out of mind, to uh, not think about them or to not be curious about what are the conditions like. And I think what COVID did was sort of expose, as has been said before, the tide goes out and what do you see? And across Europe, what we saw was the reality of what had been going on for, for a very, very long time, which was um, exploitation, to put it mildly, of, of workers and, and what they were doing in the, in, the, in the meat factories. And I suppose, you know, I did, I looked at what was going on in Ireland um, and the fact that the workers were, were not being treated the same as others. And we know that parts of you know, Ireland, the counties and the Midlands had to be shut down because of the meat, the meat factories. But also I ended up doing a, a sort of a year long look at um, the meat industry across Europe with a, another colleague. And we looked at um, the sort of two tier system of the meat workers, the employees, and you sort of think meat work is really, really hard. It's, it's a grim job to be killing and to be around, uh, be around it. It's hard, it's, it's tough work. A lot of the workers take painkillers just to get through the day. Um, but, 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 but then you also have the employees and you have the, the agency workers, this floating subcontracted uh, cohort of workers. And, and we found in, in certain countries, as was reported by many other journalists, that you know, part of the problem about tracking COVID was that they, didn't, they couldn't track the workers because the workers were essentially invisible to the authorities. And so you suddenly realize that, you know, Eating is such a is such an essential act, but it's also such a lovely act, as you'll all have this weekend. You know, it's an act of love, it's an act of community. Um, but then you see this other side, which is that you can be eating mouthfuls of misery and other people's misery. Um, and I suppose we, we we think about exploitation back in sort of Charles Dickens' times, and I think it's become incredibly entrenched and normalised in parts of the food industry. And it's it's one that uh, I think it's where. Uh, journalism plays an essential role and papers like The Guardian that are willing to stand up, pay for it, defend the journalists as well from a legal point of view, play an essential role as well. Yeah, well, because um, you had also been part of the team who reported on exploitation in the fishing industry here in Ireland for The Guardian, well, I guess, seven years ago now when it first came out. And as you say, The Guardian has defended that reporting against a number of le legal actions and has stood by everything that was, was exposed. And, a line in your reporting on the meat processing that really stuck with me, and I know stuck with a lot of other people, was a worker who said to you, you know, if the disease was in the animals, they would have shut the factory down. When the disease was in the people, they kept the factories open. That was very, very stark and was true. I mean, I know you, you know, I don't mean to, to put you in the position of the, on the panel being the misery guts, but do you think that through that we have exposed something that was kind of an open secret? Or do you think that people were actually shocked that there are workers providing what goes in their supermarket trolleys who are being treated in a way that, as you say, might be, we might quite um, you know, wrongly associate with past times, but actually is something that has been going on all the time. It's been going on for a long time. And I think you know, part of the problem is the, you know, it's the dark corners, it's the secrecy, it's, the, it's the, the fact that these places are not easy to get into. And if you're a member of the public, how do you even begin? I mean, when you're a journalist, it's hard enough, let me tell you. If you're a member of the public, how do you even begin to get into that to kind of understand what's going on? Um, you know, we have, um, and we are lucky to have, you know, a huge number of, of workers that have come from other countries into Ireland to do that work. And uh, it's a four billion, the meat industry in Ireland is a four billion euro industry. It's a very, very successful, economically successful industry. Um, and they've played a, a massive part in that. Um, but, you know, these are workers who uh, can't always speak English, aren't necessarily integrated into the community. This can be quite a high turnover as well. So, you know, by necessity, it's, it's hard, it's, it's, you know, very hard for the public and to put responsibility on the public to, mm -hmm. to have that sort of insight. I think, you know, where the questions perhaps should be more directed is obviously the meat industry themselves and then also the, the state and the authorities. I mean, that is essentially what the authorities are for. They're there to make sure that the employment laws are abided by and that the conditions are... It's very easy to blame okay. the consumer or the diner at the end of the day when it's much higher up the chain that the, mm. the responsibility lies. Kuan, as a, as a chef and a food writer, you know, how, how do you deal with the kind of overwhelming reality that as a, a cook in Ireland, you can access some of the most incredible artisan produced produce, but at the same time, there's also a lot of food being produced and eaten in Ireland that is produced under 
exploitative conditions. I mean, it runs such an enormous gamut. Like how, as a chef and a food writer, do you deal with that? But also, what do you think the role of chefs and restaurants are in terms of promoting the right way of doing things or not, you know, basically feeding into an industry that has the, this darker side? Mm. I think um, we can't underestimate the power that an entity like a restaurant has. And especially when we talk about, and this is something that I kind of like go back and forth with, with fine dining is, you know, how inclusive and how um, right is, a, is, is the business of fine dining, Do you know? It's charging huge amounts of money, um, telling a story ultimately for a minority of our community. But fine dining and what kind of has kept me in the game essentially is has this power to tell a story based on um, doing the right thing. And for me, when I cook and I have a passion for produce and a passion for ingredients and a passion for the people who grow and go to these incredible lengths to actually produce this food, I can tell that story. And by standing up, um, there's this thing which I find a little bit perverse is that people adore chefs. And when journalists, food producers, anthropologists stand up and have stayed at a, a stage at a symposium, often it's half full. But when a chef stands up on stage, people flock to it. And it's this kind of adoration, you know? Um, and unless we're telling the right messages, I think there's a real, you know, we're in danger there. I've heard so many chefs just talk about themselves and just be egotistical about how great their restaurant's been and how wonderful their foraging is and all that type of stuff. But I think we really need to tell, tell a story about um, the people behind it and, and, and what choosing great produce does to support that economy. Mm -hmm. um, again, talking to Ella earlier, it's very easy to sound very elitist in this way because of course not everyone can afford to eat you know organic in fact organic food you know i think we was talking to um some friends earlier um makes up for 1.7 percent of the food, total food produced in ireland so how can we expect to feed an entire nation on organic food when organic food can't actually sustain our nation at all so with that it's you know it's it's difficult to really for me to say people need to do this do that the best I can do is really do the best I can do, you know, and just stand up for my own beliefs in that way. Going to that idea of telling the stories behind the people, because at the end of the day, it is a person living on a farm or working in a meat processing factory or working in a restaurant or so on. Um, Edwina, like small farming communities uh, in rural Ireland, particularly in the west of Ireland, obviously been struggling for many years with being able to make a certain way of life still economically viable and uh, there have been different ways of doing that, obviously, with either converting to a more intensive industrial way of farming, which some have done. Others have had to convert to forestry, which is something that I know is very controversial um, up in Leitrim. Like what, you know, Leitrim is one of our smallest counties, um, and it's a county that has suffered very much depopulation over the last you know, 150 years. Like what are the choices that have been faced by communities in Leitrim, like where you live, in terms of those decisions of how you manage to make a living in a place that it can be often very difficult. And what is the social impact of some of those choices, especially around the forestry? Because I know that's become very controversial in the last couple of years. Yeah, well, there's lots of different paths. And I think it's really what the next door neighbor is doing that the next farmer follows and the next farmer follows. And when someone at the mart says this idea is happening around going planting, then the word spreads and the next person follows. So there's lots of different paths, but intensive farming has been definitely, like even on our own farm at home, that's the way it's gone. Um, and I'm slowly trying to get my brother to move organic and less intensive and look at different ways of farming, that it's not just livestock. But um, the organic co-op in Drumchambo, I, I speak about them so highly and regularly because what they've done is quite amazing and we have huge numbers now of organic farmers and looking at several different ways of farming. So I, I did a documentary with them there recently and I interviewed a lot of people prior to the documentary asking them, what is a farmer? Mainly children. And they all said, male, cows, 
green fields. They were the, the three things. So after I sat them all down and watched the documentary afterwards and there was tree farmers and flower farmers and vegetable farmers and all sorts and, and all different types of livestock as well. So there are people who have gone down that path and they're very much making it viable and they're feeding back into the community. Um, but then there's the other path as well of the forestry and it got, we could be sitting here for hours just trying to dis talk about it and understand it but it is definitely something that has taken over in our county. It's massive. There's um, something like 320 crow parks in Leitrim in forestry at the moment in Sitka Spruce. And they've been encouraged to do this and it's understandable because if a, an elderly farmer doesn't have anybody to hand his farm over to, you know, it's, that's the path that you take. Um, but there's right ways and wrong ways of doing it and it would be beautiful if we saw forests in Leitrim come into, um, in a natural sense, that it's not uh, monoculture and not purely for industrial purposes, that it is for something that the community can have in years to come. Um, so that path is causing a lot of bother in Leitrim and it has divided a community in one sense because people want to be able to sell their land and if they're selling it at a higher price to the forestry companies who are outbidding the local farmers, you know, you can't, you can't um, deny them that, that they're trying to make money. And then there are the people who have to live in these communities and don't want it. So it has divided our community in one sense, but I think it has opened the eyes of the Irish nation to what's happening, not just in Leitrim, it happens all across Ireland. Yeah. But in regards to social, it has been a huge social um, hindrance for a lot of us. Like there's townlands that have completely disappeared under plantations. And uh, it's hard, like uh, the main thing that a lot of the people would speak about is the light. Even where I live, I live like on a hill around a lake and you can see the lights of all our people that live around, you know, and if they're home. And that's one of the things the older communities speak about is the plantations block the light. Mm -hmm. And they don't mean just the light of the sun, but they mean the light of the community as well. Um, but we're working and hopefully um, policy right, will just, eventually yeah. change. But the, also that aspect of the wider community and the positiveness around farming and what farming is and the self-sustaining of it has really changed the mindset as well of the people moving to Leitrim. So at one stage you could get land and houses in Leitrim, no problem, but everything is just whipped up now and everyone that is moving there isn't coming just for a home. They want land, be it one acre or 20 acres and it's to grow you know, and self-sustain and look at becoming farmers, whatever type of farmer that will be. So it's a very positive image. And a lot of them are artists, which is a real benefit as That's well. It's really cool. I mean, the idea of people wanting to become farmers, of course, yeah. kind of upends a lot of our narratives about that. It's interesting you say there about like the social cost of the Sikra spruce uh, plantations. It's been a controversial issue in some places in Kerry. And just from speaking to members of my own family, on our family sheep farm, some of it was turned over to forestry. Just the, the difficulty of trying to make the state forestry body understand the social and ecological costs of choosing inappropriate monocultural forestry over living natural native deciduous forestry has been, well it's driven my uncle to distraction and I think it's driven a lot of people to distraction and Ella I wonder if I could ask you about that in terms of wider um, agricultural questions which is the role of the state because as you say the state is the one who is supposed to be overseeing meat processing facilities and the way that people are treated. The state is the one who's making a lot of the decisions when it comes to the choice of forestry, which is having a huge impact on our ecosystem and so on. And the state has a big role to play in the agribusiness sector in general. What could the state be doing differently in this era of environmental crisis and big changes in the way that farming is done and farming communities live? Like, do they have options or is it the case that the way it is is the way that the state kind of has to do things? I mean, of course, they have options. They have huge firepower when it comes to spending through farm subsidies, uh, number one, you know, billions and billions and billions, but also through procurement. So they, they, they buy a lot of things. They buy food, so food into old people's homes and all the rest and, and into schools and all the rest. So there's huge ability for the state to direct the funds. But I think one of the real issues, especially given, and we can't, for, you know, who forgets, we're in a climate biodiversity crisis, of the most monumental proportion. So absolutely everything else in some ways is by the wayside, given what we're facing and the catastrophe that we're facing in a very short period of time, um, probably shorter than any of us realize. 
and that that actually you know the state I mean obviously the state is going to is going to have to act in in that regard but you know the state has a huge ability to be able to to move quickly if they want to I mean from the point of view of things like employment law they need to enforce the law and there isn't enough enforcement I think that's really evident like one of the things that I discovered when I did the piece about the agency workers in Europe and I looked at what was going on in Ireland and the agencies that supply these workers, in the last couple of years, 1.3% of them had been inspected and of that, there was a 40% non-compliance. So like, there's an equation for people to think about, you know. So, you know, and, and the same would be in, in the fishing sector in that, you, you know, if you want to uphold the law, you have to make sure that you have the resources there to make sure that you, you, you can inspect and you can enforce and all the rest. But, you know, I think, getting back to something that Edwina, Edwina said, I mean, one of the big things from a farming perspective, I think, is also thinking about what is a farmer? You know, we, we think in Ireland so much of, you know, and farmers are very privileged. They're born into land or they're able through money to be able to buy land or whatever. It's a state of affairs that the vast majority of us will never be able to afford. But with that privilege, obviously, comes a huge amount of responsibility and work. Um, and skill and all the rest. But what is a farmer? I mean, is a farmer there to produce food? Or is a farmer there for a much broader definition of, of what they would have done in the past, which is to manage the land in a way that is in some sort of balance with the ecological, in the, the natural ecological state of the land? And I think that maybe we've tilted far too far in the balance of, you know, just producing food to the cost of everything else. And that, you know, the likes of, you know, brilliant Dr. Brendan Dunford down in Clare and Michael Daverin, the farmers down in Clare, who've shown that, you know, the, far, the definition of a farmer is much broader than that. And in the future, the definition of farming is going to be much broader than that. And policy has to take that into account as well. Um, and just on, one other thing that struck me when Edwina was talking about the Sitka spruce plantations, and I know the key thing there as well is also the ownership of it. Who, is, who owns you know, is it pension funds from, you know, different countries, Swedish pension funds owning parts of, of, of townlands of Leitrim and all the rest. But it's also that when you look at rewilding, you know, there strikes fear of God into farmers, that word. And there's a reason for that, which is that, that you know, they fear that it'll take the person, the farmer, out of the community. And there is an interesting dynamic happening now where quite a lot of the West is increasingly being bought, big farms are being bought, big swathes of land are being bought by people who, who want to rewild. Um, good intentions are necessary in terms of from an ecological point of view, but play that tape forward. You know, is there a danger that we're going down a similar route in that we may then have ecologically interesting places, but we still don't have the people? Yeah. And it goes back to that question of what is a farmer for and what can the, how can we broaden the role of a farmer quickly and fund that to make sure that people stay in rural parts and that we don't have a situation, for example, that you have in parts of Scotland where billionaires are buying up 30,000 hectares and closing the doors. Yeah, exactly. People in the West of Ireland, from people in Kerry, don't want to be living in a theme park, you know, um, whether it's an ecological theme park or one designed for tourism or whatever. And for those of you who will be here tomorrow, Ella will be talking with some farmers from the local area here in Kerry who are trying to find a middle path there of regenerative farming that involves rewilding land, but also still being able to use it for farming to keep, you know, communities and, and, and farming going. Um, Kuon, you know, I was talking to you about your trip down here to the West, and yesterday you visited some various different producers who you want to work with on your project um, in West Cork, uh, which we haven't managed to reclaim for Kerry yet, but one day, <laughs> one day we'll, ma we'll manage to snag it back. Um, when you do visits like that, or when you're planning, you know, scheming in your head about the future of your project, which I believe will involve a restaurant at some point, and hopefully will involve a restaurant at some point again in the future, you know, how do you think about those things? Because you obviously want to have a very direct relationship with people who are supplying food to your restaurant. Um, and obviously a key element is what food they're able to sell you and whether you're then able to use it in your restaurant and sell it and so on. But at the same time, those are people who are living in a community, stewards of the land, trying to provide the same perhaps power of example that you were saying that maybe a restaurant can by showing things can actually be done in a different way or there are different ways of thinking about things. Like, how important are those personal relationships there for you um, in terms of the, 
the chef or the cook and the producer? Like, how, is that, how does that relationship play in your mind? Vital, vital. For me, it's really, uh, it's really integral to how I um, view the product or view the end product, you know, and that might be a plate of food or it might be a juice or it might be a dessert, but um, I fundamentally believe that, you know, great produce makes my cooking better. You know, it's just, it's part and parcel. If um, it's silly sometimes, you know, it might, I might not have an ingredient that from one day to the next and I'll go drive an hour one way for it just because I think, you know, the person that's never had that dish in their life is going to notice it's not there, which makes no sense at all, but um, which just drives me to hysteria. But, and, and similarly, I'm driving across the country from Dublin to Cork because I think it's, it makes sense from a, you know, geographical, you know, it's, but it's still th four, almost uh, three hours to drive from Cork to Kerry today. Like it, it absolutely made no sense to do. It would have been much easier just to drive straight from Dublin this morning. But, and while I'm doing this drive, I'm thinking, you know, wh how am I going to be received on the other end? You know, is Sally Barnes going to have time for me? Is Fingal, you know, going to want to spare a minute? They have so much going on. You know, Fingal Ferguson, I, I visited yesterday uh, around lunchtime. He has uh, a herd of 140 um, Frisian cattle um, producing his incredible goobine cheese with a team of, um, or a staff force of 20. They have, um, within goobine, they're uh, producing um, salamis, mortadellas, hams. Um, on top of that, he's also a knife smith or a, a blade smith, producing some of the best knives in the world. Um, and I arrive up and, you know, he just, he, he doesn't know me from Adam, you know, other than a message on Instagram and he gives me two and a half hours of his time. And it's, it's so obvious that he doesn't have this time to give me, you know, it's so, his, his hands are full of like poo and, you know, night or, or metal matter. And it's just, it's crazy. And then afterwards he's like, do you want a bowl of soup and a cup of tea? Do you know, afterwards, like they're just so giving. And afterwards I jumped in a car and drove um, the other side of Skibbereen to Sally Barnes, um, who is the only um, wild salmon smokery left in Ireland. Um, and she's, I, I don't know how old she is, but she's uh, older than me anyway. Um, but like just an incredible personality. Um, again, just gave me all, all the information I could possibly desire, plus, you know, her salmon, um, but time and knowledge. And it's just, it's so obvious that that, that knowledge isn't always going to be there. And I feel, I feel so um, privileged to be able to, and I always have felt very privileged anyway, just like being a white male growing up in Ireland. But um, I feel like hugely privileged to be able to learn this information from these type of people and then share that and pay it forward, you know, because it's always paying it forward. Yeah. Um, someone reached out to me a couple of months ago about um, a, a blueberry farmer that had just had this massive blueberry crop, bumper crop, uh, this year, as opposed to last year, there was like very, very few. They were in their third year of growing. Um, and I reached out I, to a couple of chefs um, and I reached, I, I did a little message on Twitter and it was absolutely phenomenal to see the level of support that that post got. And like, if I do a post on Twitter, I'm, I might get like three, three retweets. This got 350. Um, and it was just people coming together and they sold the whole crop within the whole summer. It was gone. You know, and then from that, you just create this. I, I visit them a couple of months later and you just see this. It's, it's just an incredible connection that will just last forever. And you know, for year on, year on, it's just this, this relationship. I guess it's about relationships and you know, as what comes through there as well is, is passion. You know, mm -hmm. it's the same when Edwina and you were talking about the mummers and, you know, not just from the side of those of you who were running the project and engaged, you know, being a part of the... Uh, of the mummers, but also the people who you met and the passion that they had for it. And I suppose those are the inspiring stories of like how people care so much about their food, they care so much about the land, they care so much about the community where they come from. Um, and that's obviously, I mean, that's priceless, I suppose, in some ways. Mm -hmm. But maybe the question is, you know, how do we harness that passion in a way that can bring about positive change? And if we think about the, our food future, or the future of our communities. I mean, Edwina, you, you, live, in, you live in that community in Leitrim. You know, if we had the power to make you, you know, queen of Leitrim for a day, um, <laughs> what would you want to see, you know, change 
in the next 20 years, you know, while your children are growing up there? Oh yeah, I always look from the children's point of view, the next generation. Um, I think to look back, to move forward and look at what like my grandfather and their generation were doing, they seemed to have it pretty right. Like it was very simple, self-sustaining. Everybody was happy with what they had. There was no excessive need. I think that's a, a big part of it. And also to let go of the mentality of perfectly green fields with nothing else grown in them, perfectly cut three foot hedges, perfectly straight. You know, that mentality of everything, you know, instead of having a field that is full of rushes, which we have in Leitrim, that rather than seeing it as bad land, that it, how can we work with it and what is it useful for? Um, like language is very powerful. One of the things that I encounter a lot when I'm meeting with representatives and it's all to see how we can improve farming in Leitrim is they always say, Leitrim farmers need to be compensated for their land. And I always pull them up on it and say, how about reward it? And just changing that word can totally change mentality. And I think that's also something I'd like to see change is celebrating the land that we have and that we work with and reminding ourselves that we don't own it. It's there for the next generation. And, um, and then the last thing I would say that I'd love to see is um, communal farming. And again, that's looking back to look forward. It's not a new concept. And I think that's the way forward because community is future. That idea of looking back to look forward is very powerful. I mean, one of the arguments I used to make when I was doing food history was food is kind of a prism for everything in society because it connects to everything. And so it kind of reveals and refracts all the different fissures and different elements of our lives, whether it's through our culture, our economy, or our society. And it's always changing as well. I mean, Ella, I might ask you, you know, about that same question about what you'd like to see change in our food future. Um, you know, there's been an enormous revolution in our diet in the Western world in the last 60 years of people eating a lot more meat. That's the same in the biggest countries in the developing world, in China and India as well. The world's demand for meat and dairy has increased massively, which is obviously a huge sustainability question. You know, what, what do you think that we need to do? If you, you know, do we need to look to some kind of vegan future? Is there some kind of middle path that we can do? What, if we could make you, you know, dictator for a day, what would your future decision be? Do that now. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I suppose, you know, to what end? I go back to that key thing, which is we're in a climate biodiversity crisis. It's, it's a, we're sick of saying it, but the reality is, as we are. And so if we want a future, things need to change quickly, let alone what kind of future do we want? And, you know, it's very, very hard and negative to have to actually put y yourself in the mindset of listening to climate scientists who privately are panicking constantly about the fact that we may not have a future you know, in a short period of time. And so from that point of view, you know, food is the biggest driver of, uh, you know, carbon emissions, nitrogen emissions, biggest driver of water pollution, all the things that we need to address. And so we need radical, radical rethink of the food system, if you could even call it a food system. And obviously it's, a, it's very globalized. I think here in Ireland, there's a few kind of th key things we could do quite quickly. I think we're very siloed in our thinking. Um, at government level, we need to, to, to break those silos so that it's not just one department who is responsible for both the selling of and also the regulation of food, we'll say. Um, it's, just, it's just no good for the future at all. We need to make sure that we, we have some, you know, we see everything through the lens of, of the, the crisis that we're in and, and we can find a way to act quickly on that as well. Um, so, for example, when Edwina said, and it's something that I hear all the time, people are wanting to farm and you know, own a bit of land, policy needs to respond to that. Subsidies can't just go into a certain type of farming. The policy needs to respond to that. Those people will need help to farm uh, sustainably and uh, economically. And so you know, there needs to be those sort of shifts. Um, I would say you know, the food industry needs to look, you know, not exploit their workers. This sort of is the ABC of life. Don't, you know, pay, pay, pay your taxes. Don't dodge taxes. Don't offshore your profits, you know? So there's those sort of things as well. You make sure that if you pollute, you pay, and the state has a huge role in, in making sure that that can happen or not, as the case may be. I mean, it's all the kind of uncomfortable things that are about money and power that we don't really want to talk about, um, but that we need to make sure it needs to happen. Because farmers in general, I mean, it's my opinion that farmers have 
you know, the, the goodwill of the Irish public very much, you know, people in general, I don't buy this idea that people are giving out about farmers' effort and centre. They might be on, on Twitter, a small cohort, but re in, the rea in the general scheme of things, I think farmers have a lot of support from the public, as they should, because their job is immense now at a very, very short timescale that we have to fix this. The final thing I would say is, I think from a local point of view, and looking at the Dingle Peninsula here and the amazing sort of exciting things that are happening with farmers and local sort of infrastructure to support local food. Things like um, food policy and groups are a really good idea so that you don't just look at the kind of the food element, but you look at the wider power element as well. And it gives local people, it's happened all over the world since the 70s, where you have food policy councils at a local, air, a local level. And I think it can empower people, you can bring schools into there, it can empower people and get wider voices into uh, the food system because that's the key thing is we need more women farming, we need more women voices in general in it, but we need much broader voices as well uh, to, to shape the kind of future that we want. I think that that's a wonderful and very powerful note to finish on. It's, there's a lot of field work to do, but at the same time, the passion that the three of you have shown and the passion that all of us, I think, in Ireland, you know, we are a people people of the land in many ways because the land is so integral to our to our childhoods to our way of thinking about ourselves to our way of thinking about our culture and society that people do want to see change and the, both the uncomfortable elements and the inspiring elements need to be brought together for us to be able to face those problems so I really want to thank all three of you to Edwina to Kuon and to Ella for joining me on this panel um, thank you all for listening and now we actually have a very special uh, next uh, act as it were because as we mentioned earlier Edwina is an award-winning Shannos dancer and uh, she's going to be joined by West Kerry's very own award-winning Cormac Begley um, who are going to do a performance for us uh, so Kuon and Ella and I are going to exit stage well stage right actually rather than stage right, um, and leave the floor to Edwina and Cormac so thank the three of you very much
Ich bin ein Jig that I wrote for my godson. He uh, lives over the road. His name is Sorin. And Sorin is an old Viking name that means God of War. And I wrote this tune for him for his birthday. Uh, and I called it To War. Um, more of a command or an order to go to war um, than a celebration of war, but as a command to go to war when you're left with no alternative. So I'll play this cheek for you. great it's very hard not to dance um, so for my style of dancing Shanos dancing I only heard that being called Shanos probably about 15 years ago prior to that like it was just get up and dance or batter or throw a few steps or um, single turn was sometimes what they refer to at home but uh, it's very um, much about responding to the music and knowing the tune in your head and the musician brings out different things. So if you asked me what I just did a few seconds ago when Cormac was playing, I haven't a clue. And if you asked me what I'm going to do next, I still don't know. Anything comes out. There's, you know, different musicians bring it out in different ways, but dancing to Cormac is just phenomenal. There's not too many that can um, make you dance like that. It's wonderful. But uh, my grandfather played the fiddle and brought me with him everywhere he was going. He also danced, but very seldom got to dance because he always had to play. But he'd bring me 
to um, the house concerts at home and people would come to his house too. And that's where I saw the dancing and learned how to dance really. So nobody took my hand and said, this is how you do this step or you know, this dance. You have to watch and listen and understand the rhythms and then make your own of it. And always before I danced, I'd say, well, if you're going to dance a specific tune, make sure you can sing it first before you try dance to it. Uh, so that's how I learned. It was really um, special. And everyone that I learned from was probably dead by the time I was 10. Um, they were a really old generation. But some of the things that I saw and, and why I'm sitting on a door, I'll explain. So some of the um, traditions for dancing on the, the old flagstone floors, people used to say to me, you're a great one for knocking sparks. And the idea behind that was they would wear the heavy work boots that had hobnails or sometimes donkey shoes on the toes and heels. And when they were dancing on the flagstone floors, sparks would fly out of their shoes. And that's the idea behind that saying, knocking sparks. And uh, they would do other things, always men, it was very seldom women that I saw dancing, but they would do things to challenge each other in the house then for the complete crack. Um, they would take down the frying pan, the cast iron frying pan over the fire, and they would dance in that and try and knock sparks out of it. Or they would um, dance on the table and they would put soap and water on it to see who could dance the best steps without falling. <laughs> and another thing as well, if you're ever in one of the old cottages, um, that still have the flagstone floor at the risk of looking crazy. If you go around knocking on the floor and you'll hear how it's really solid, except for right in front of the fireplace, that was the dancing stone. And it would be hollow, there would be a big boom there and that's where the dancers danced, which I thought was always a really stupid place for dancers to dance because it's the hottest place in the house, right in front of the fire. But before they would put down the flagstone floor, they would dig a hole there and they would put the skull of a horse's head in there and then lay the flag on top of it. So it would be really solid, but also really hollow. So there was a man in Clare recently, I was telling that story to some dancers, and he said he was renovating his father's house in uh, Fecal, and they came across seven horses' skulls in the kitchen. So that was surely a really great dancing house. Um, but other things, apart from um, the dancing on the table and everything. They would also dance on barrels and then the door. So they, they would take down their front door and dance on that. And then if they still couldn't decide who was the best dancer and uh, with the best steps, they would put a pint of water on each corner and you had to dance your best steps without spilling the water. That's still a really big tradition at home around Arigna, the mines, a lot of the dancers used to do that. And then the last thing, which is the only thing that I never saw, but I heard great stories of, if they couldn't decide who was the best dancer on the door, they would bring the door outside and put it on the chimney, and they had to go up and dance on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I'll do a few steps on the door for you. Give me my go. Thank you. 
the South Wind Blows production, and I'm Christopher Kassan. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to your company next time on Ireland's Edge. <laughs>